This week in the Parsha of Bullock, <coughs> Bullock, as we will read in a moment, was appointed to be the king of Moab. Initially, Og and Sichon, these were the two giants. They were the protectors of all the nations of Canaan. And they would sit on the boundary of Canaan on the walls to protect the nations and they paid protection money to them. And they had nothing to fear, nothing to be fearful of. But we read last week in the Parsha how Moshe Rabbeinu, how he had killed both of them. Miraculously, physically it was impossible to kill these people. And now they're beside themselves because they realize, as Rashi cites the Midrash, if they were able to topple these two giants, and these two giants couldn't stop the Jews, we as ordinary people, could we stop the Jews? It's an impossibility. So literally they were terrified. They were beside themselves. They really didn't know what to do. So Rashi cites the Midrash. They are Bolog ben Sipor. He had seen. What did he see? Omar These two kings that we relied upon them. Lo'omdu b'fneim could not stand in the presence of the Jews. Onu Allah has kam v'kama. So we, do we have a chance? L'fichoch v'yogar Moab. Therefore Moab was terrified. Yogar is an expression more than fearful, afraid, terrified. The Vidrush tells us that to destroy Og and Sichon, it was more difficult than destroying uh, Egypt with all its chariot corps and all its armies. A nation, its power is not based only on number, but it's based on the archangel that backs it. Every nation of the world has an archangel. And that archangel, based on its dimension, will determine how powerful that nation is. See, even though number-wise, Sichon and Og may have been smaller numbers, but factually, in terms of the spiritual representation, it was much more than Egypt and Paro, with all the armies and chariot corps. And Moshe was concerned. Although he had defeated Egypt, who said he would be able to def defeat Og and Sichon? So the Midrash cites a verse where God says to Moshe, I will cut them from above and they will be toppled from below. Meaning I will destroy their archangel and once the archangel is destroyed, the people fall naturally. As we find that after the archangel of Egypt was weakened, this is when the Egyptian people were destroyed. The Parov, Chelo, Yodavayam, they were destroyed. Everything in existence has a spiritual counterpart. There's the people and there's the archangel. Seventy archangels. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, the, uh, there's a morale. The morale of Prague writes that Yocheved and Miriam, they were the midwives. Shifra and Pua, they were midwives who delivered the Jewish children in Egypt. And initially, he had summoned them. So the Midrash says, what he summoned them for? So if you read the narrative as it reads, to instruct them how they have to kill the male newborns on the birth stool. But the Midrash says, what did he summon for? He summoned them that he tried to seduce them. He wanted to have relations with them. Why? Because based on the verse, that when a man has relations with a woman, he has a certain effect on her, that she becomes totally under the so-called the control of the man. The verse, Bolayach or Soyach, the one who cohabits with the woman, he has it, puts his touches on the woman in a way. So by having relations with her, with them, somehow they would succumb to his, to his dictates, even though it meant killing Jewish children. But it says, by Tirena Imaldus is Elohim, they feared God, they rebuffed him didn't make a difference, Egypt or whatever it was, they totally, they rejected him. So Maral writes in the Gurus Hashem, what Paro knew this, 
didn't know this. But the archangel of Egypt, very often the person doesn't know why he does things. It's what we call the mazel. There's a mazel. That's the, a person has a mazel, has an archangel also. An individual angel. A nation has an angel. So this was pushing him, or the thought came to mind, because that's a way to somehow to control the Jews, to de destroy the Jews. Not that he understood why. He had a desire for them. He had an idea of why not. But did he know the whole understanding that a man who cohabits with a woman he has control over? He didn't know this. So very often, a nation it makes decisions how to go to battle or strategize a battle has nothing to do with the, the, in, the ingenious of the, necessarily the generals. I mean, of course, they, they, they're trained and they're strategists. That's true. But one of a kind of strategist. It's because the archangel who backs them puts thoughts in their minds and advises them and guides them and as a result of that. So everything is dependent on the spiritual counterpart of the particular nation. So Moshe understood that the spiritual counterpart of Ogen Sichon was something which was more than Egypt. Shem says, you have nothing to worry about. I will cut them from above and they will fall from below. It's over. They will no longer exist. Now, how does Bilon come into the picture? Sichon initially conquered the territory of Sichon. Part of it was Moab. The Jewish people were not permitted to to conquer Moab's territory. But because Sichon had conquered Cheshbon, which was a city which initially was part of the Moab territory, it says Tiro Sichon. Moab was, was purified, it was cleansed because through the conquest of Sichon. Now how did Sichon conquer Cheshbon? This was the city. So the Medjish tells us that is Sichon as powerful as he was, he couldn't conquer it. So he went to Bilam, and Bilam he cursed the members of the Sichon community. And by cursing them, the city fell, and Sichon was able to take, take, visit, make, make the conquest of Cheshbon. So now, Sichon, who's more than Egypt and all its armies, wasn't able to conquer Cheshbon. And why was he able to conquer Cheshbon? Because Bilam cursed them. So how powerful is the word of Bilam? His power lies in his mouth. Moshe Rabbeinu, he defeated Egypt. But seemingly, Bilam seems to be no less of a power than Moshe is a power. Because it says they did their due diligence. They said, where does this man, where did he develop into something special? To a leadership position. In Midian. So he said the man is paralyzed in his mouth, his power of speech. That's where it lies. So if that's the case, why was he able to topple Sichon and Og? Because his power of speech, we have a person who's even more than Sichon. Because he was able to topple Cheshbon, that Sichon wasn't able to conquer Cheshbon. Therefore, this, why, this is why this allayed their fears to some degree that Bilam would be their so called their ace in the hole to be able to guarantee their continuation. But of course, there's no Rechaim HaKadosh that explains, they said, when they sent the message, when they tried to commission Bilam, they said, Eisa she tevorach mevorach, Eisa she teort, you are, what you bless is blessed, and what you curse is cursed. So Rabbi Nebachi writes, they only said that, Bolak knew the truth. The man is a personification of evil. The curse a man doesn't have to have any spiritual entity or essence to give a curse. Curse, firstly, it's dependent on the innate evil in a person, especially Ayn Hara, the evil eye. It emanates from the evil which exists within a person, a bad eye. Right? We, in Pirkei Obos, we contrast Talmidi Avram, the students of Avram, Talmidi Bilam, one's Ayn Tova, one's Ayn Roh. Right? That's how we contrast them. As much as the students of Avram or Ayin Tova, a good eye in the most exceptional way, that's Talmide Bilam were Ayin Ra in the what? And as Avram was Nefesh Shvelo, he had a humble spirit, he had Nefesh Rechova, pompous, self absorbed, megalomaniac, mania, that's what he was, Bilam. This is how we contrast them. 
So therefore, what do you tell a man like that? Your value is purely negative and evil. What you bless is blessed. But of course, it meant nothing. It was just flattery, false flat flattery, because otherwise they didn't want to insult the man. This is Rabbi Abachir. But the Archaim HaKadosh writes that his words are interesting. He says... Venira, the Rechaim HaKodesh, ki l'olam birchas bilom ki birchas chamor. The blessing of bilom had no greater value than the blessing of a donkey. El ha'sha rosho hi marim, but this evil man, he would deceive people, but he was an expert astrologer. And he would see in the stars when good fortune was to come upon a person, and he'd go to the person and he'd say, I want to give you a blessing. Knowing it's unrelated to him, this was destined to happen. When you would see a person would ascend to greatness, he would go and play the role. I want to give you a blessing. And sure enough, soon afterwards, he, the blessing would come to fruition. And when it would happen, and the person would be blessed, he would think that what was the cause of the blessing was Bilam. It was his mazel. It was his star. Same thing. He gave Bolok a blessing. You're going to be a king. You're going to be the king of Moab. How did he see it? He, he, he saw it in the stars. He was this expert astrologer. So Bilam, so the way Rechaim Akkadosh is learning, when he said, he truly believed it. What you bless is blessed, and what you curse is cursed. Because he personally was a beneficiary of the blessing, not knowing that he already knew in advance through the astrology that he was in ascent to be a king, the king of Moab. He blessed him to deceive him, as if he was the cause, and it only happened because of his blessing, which is unrelated. I always mention, there's a Gemara, at the end of a comma, where the Gemara tells over a story of Kahana, was one of the great rabbis of the Talmud, Amaroim, interpreters of the Mishnah. And he was one of the leading sages in Babylon. He wasn't, he wasn't from Israel, from Yerushalayim. He wasn't a Yerushalmi. And the law is that if a person is an informer, he's considered a rodef, a pursuer, and you, you're permitted, you're obligated to kill him. And there was a certain Jew in Babylon. It was, then it was under the control of the Persian government. And he informed the Jews that many Jews were being put to death by the Persians. So being one of the leading Torah authorities in Bovil, he summoned this person. He says, I, I want to give you a warning. If you we even sense you're going to inform another Jew, we're going to put you to death. We're going to kill you. The moment he said it to this Jew, this informer, he immediately realized he's going immediately to the Iranian authorities, to the person he's going to inform on him. So that means the leaving as he was going was an act of putting his life in jeopardy. Rav Khanna immediately takes him, breaks his neck. He kills him. He kills this Jew. What happens? Immediately word goes out. He was the main informer for the government. Rav Khanna killed their informer. He becomes a fugitive. Kana's a fugitive. They have wanted signs all over Bovell. Rabbi Kana wanted. This is pre post office. Okay? So uh, he had a flee. He fled. He fled to Eretz Of course, that wasn't under the control of the Persian government, the Babylonian Persian government. And, but even though he was obligated to kill him, as if we find a person who falls off a roof, where a person didn't make a parapet on the roof, it says he has a degree of liability. Why? Even though the mental person was meant to die, the person doesn't fall off a roof because the person didn't have a fence, a parapet on the roof. But nevertheless, we have a principle of When God brings tragedy, he brings it through a person who's not meritorious. We bring merit through a meritorious person, and we bring a detriment through a person who's not worthy. So if, if a person falls off the roof, it's an indication, why did God choose him to be the one that through him this tragedy should happen? Of course, he's a person who's unworthy. 
So Rav Kana felt that if he had to kill him, he deserved to be killed. But why did he have to be the one to take the life of the Jew? That reflected negatively on him. So he realized he has to do tshuva, even though he had a right to kill him. But nevertheless, there's some kind of spiritual deficiency in himself. He has to do tshuva. So what, what did he do? He was the leading Torah sage one of the lead, in, in, in Babylon, accepted upon himself. For seven years, he will remain silent, not to reveal his greatness in Torah. In a public setting. So he comes to Yushalayim, Rav Kana. Who does he meet on the street? Rav Shimon Lokish, the primary student of Rabbi Yochanan. Rav Yochanan, the author of Yushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. And he says to Rav Shlokish, he says, so what, what are you talking about in the in the study halls today? In the What's the subject matter? So he shares with them. Rish Lokish was at a level that all the students of Rav Yochanan were not at his level. And he begins entering into a Torah dialogue with Rav Rish Lokish, Rav Shimon Lokish. He dazzles him. He never saw such a thing in his life. Such Torah genius and such knowledge. He immediately runs to his Rebbe, Rabbi Yochanan, and he says to Rabbi Yochanan, Ari Olami Bovil, a lion has just descended from Babylon. Somebody, I've never seen anybody like it, like this. Rabbi Yochanan was very old. Rabbi Yochanan lived into his hundred, he was over 140. And Rabbi Yochanan, he was very old, he had very long eyelashes. Very long eyelashes, and he couldn't see. So whenever he wanted to see, he had his students, they would take silver tongs, grab the ends of the eyelash, lift it. And when they would lift it, he'd be able to see. So Rabbi Yochanan, there were seven rows of students. Rabbi Yochanan had the best students sat in the first row. And they were graded based on their greatness. As they went further back, they were of lesser caliber. Rabbi Yochanan, being such an old man, he sat on, four cu- on seven cushions. Okay? So Rabbi Yochanan here is Ari Olam in Bovel. A lion is just the same bubble. This man must... So he poses a question to him. To Rav Kani, sitting in the front row. Rav Kani made, took upon himself an oath. He's not going to reveal who, his greatness. So, doesn't say a word. So he says, something's wrong here. So they put him back a row. He asks him another question. Remain silent. Put by the end of the session, he's in the last row. Rav Kani suffered tremendous embarrassment. Because of course he could have responded, but because he took this vow, not an oath, a vow that he will not reveal what he knows. So he said to himself, the seven rows and the level of embarrassment he had is the equivalent of remaining silent for seven years. Therefore, I'm no longer bound by the vow. So he says to Rabbi Yochanan, I'd like to start from, from the beginning again. So he poses the question, Rabbi Kana responds, in a way, again, dazzles them. So they bring him. So what? They bring him up, of course, to the front row, and they take one of the cushions out from under Rabbi Yochanan. He's on seven cushions. So every time he responds in the way where he actually he bests Rabbi Yochanan, they pull a cushion out from under Rabbi Yochanan, who's the, he's the leading Torah sage. By the time they came to the last question, again he responded with such directness. Rabbi Yochanan is sitting on the ground literally in the dust. Rabbi Yochanan was amazed. He never saw anything like it. Such genius, such Torah greatness. So Rabbi Yochanan says, I'd like to see what this man looks like. Of course, he couldn't see. It says, students, they lift up his mm-hmm. eyelashes and they see he looks like he's smirking. Rav Kanda looks like he's smirking. Meaning th- that he's mocking him. See? He, he beat the great rabbi and the rabbi's now sitting in the dust. So the Gemara says, Cholash He felt offended. He felt offended. He looked at him, he felt offended. Rav Kana died immediately. Died. So, just tell you the whole story, then I'll tell you Rabbeinu Bachir, uh, the Racham HaKadosh. Rabbeinu Bachir, how he explains it. Rabbeinu Bachir. So, afterwards, they bury Rav Kana in a cave. And afterwards, the students say to Rav Yochan, what happened? He says, he was smirking. He says, no. He had a defective lip. And the way his mouth looked, it looked like he was smirking. But he wasn't smirking. He wasn't mocking you. So what do you say, Rav Yochan? The Gemara says in Sanhedrin that an Amora had the ability to to resurrect the dead. 
She says, I'm going to the cave. He's going to resurrect Rav Kana. This is not a Midrash, this is, this is a Gemara. So he goes to the cave, and there's a viper encircling the mouth of the cave. Rabbi Yochanan can't go into the cave. So Rabbi Yochanan says to the viper, let the rabbi come to see his student. The viper doesn't move. Let a colleague go see his colleague. The viper doesn't move. Let the student come see his teacher. The viper slithers away. He's able to go into the cave. He resurrects with Kana. This is the end of the story. So, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar asks, it says he looked at him and he, he died. So evidently it seems to be an evil eye. He gave him the evil eye. But we know that anybody, the evil eye, where does it emanate from? It emanates from an impurity, an intense evil which exists within the person. Do you say Rabbi Yochanan had anything, a trace of evil in him? Chas v'sholem. So why did he, it's a, but he looked at him and he died. So Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says, Cholesh daita, he was like offended, he was taken aback. And that's why, and he looked at him, and that's why he died. So he says, Rabbi Yochanan in his life never, ever had a lapse of Torah thought in his life. Because of this incident, he had that Torah lapse in thought. Because Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Kana was the cause of that Torah lapse, that's why God took him. Because the Torah of Rabbi Yochanan was so valuable to the world, and he was the cause that that lapse should happen, therefore he was considered culpable. It had nothing to do with Rabbi Yochanan giving him the evil eye. Rabbi Yochanan was pure beyond purity. That was Rabbi Yochanan. It's interesting. You find something similar to this. Rabbi Elizabeth Hurkinus, who was a Rebbe of Rabbi Akiva, the great, he was known as Rabbi Leza the Great, Rabbi Leza Godel. So the story is about, there was an argument between him and the Chachomim, the rabbis. There was an earthenware oven that was called Tanor Achnoi. It was an oven that it was like circular. It looked like a, a like a snake that coils itself, and it became contaminated. So it becomes contaminated. What does say? An earthenware vessel cannot be immersed in the mikvah. It cannot be relieved of its contaminant. So what do you have? You have to break it. When you smash it, then it's no longer a vessel. So the Gemara has a question. And this was the argument. What about if you take the oven and you cut it into parts? So when it's in parts, it doesn't function as an oven. This earthenware. And then you reconstruct it. When you reconstruct it, is it considered a new oven? Or do we say it's the old oven, it's restored to its original status? So does it contaminate, does it not contaminate? That was the argument between Rabbi Yochanan, excuse me, the Chachomim, the Rabbonon, and Rabbi Lezer Hagodu. Rabbi Lezer and Hurkinus. Rabbi Lezer and Hurkin says it's a new oven. Therefore, if you put any food in there, produce or whatever, it does not contaminate. The Chachomim say, it does. It's the old oven restored. Therefore, anything that, that comes in contact with the oven will be contaminated. So we have a principle. If there's an argument between the minority and the majority, the majority prevails. Reb Lezeb and Hurkins wasn't willing to back down. Wasn't willing. And they ruled against them. And Reb Lezeb and Hurkins were so great, he says, if the law is like I say, let a heavenly voice come out and say, Halacha Reb Lezer. The ruling is like Reb Lezer. Sure enough, a heavenly voice comes out and says, Halacha Reb Lezer. The ruling is like Reb Lezer. The divine, God himself, concurs with Reb Lezer. Reb Yeshua, who's a colleague of Reb Lezer, says, it says he stands up and he says, Lo Bashamayim. Torah is not for God to decide. It was given over to the human mind to make the decision. At Sinai, we follow majority rule. And it says, and that was the point. And they took all the food items that were put in this oven and they burnt them because they were contaminated. And, and because Rabbi Lezim and Hurkas wasn't willing to back down, they excommunicated him. And he died in a state of excommunication because he wasn't willing to back down. Rabbi Lezim and Hurkas. When they put him in, they excommunicated him, what we call Cherem, it says that day there were gale force winds on the sea, endless ships were destroyed, crops were destroyed, the level of devastation, destruction came to the world was unbelievable. Why? 
the Oed, because a man of that dimension is pained. He himself is the equivalent of the Torah itself. There are consequences. There are ramifications. It's a semblance of similar. But he was put in that position. He was affected. He, evidently it affected him. Maybe there was also a lapse. Rebbe Lezer ben Hurkinus, who's known as Rebbe Lezer HaGodl, the great Rebbe Lezer. Therefore, there was these very, all these, these, these ramifications, consequences happened. Rebbe Yochanan did nothing wrong. But nevertheless, because, even though, again, it's Magal B'chov Zakai, he was the cause of the cause of the lapse. Therefore, he died. But it had nothing to do with Ayin Hora. But Bilam was a personification of evil. Bilam was the advisor of Paro, who advised Paro to, with the final solution. Enslave the Jews, and you will destroy them. They'll stop procreating. They won't be prolific in procreation, and that'll come. That'll bring them to an end. That was his. That was his advice. So he was an evil man, and he hated the Jews. One of a kind of hate, intense hate, which we will discuss. So Bilam is able to curse Moab with Sichon couldn't conquer. Moab, so Moshe, he himself, he destroyed Sichon. But it doesn't mean to say that Bilam, his power of speech is not the equivalent even more than Moshe's power of speech. But again, he didn't understand. Moshe's power of speech is a kokol Yaakov. Bilam is what is Ayin Hara, that's cursing. That's a curse that emanates, that's from an evil source, it's not from a holy source. That's the difference. Once discussed, we find in history there are always counterbalances. You know, there's good, there's evil. Now, Nimrod was the leading pagan king of the world. Nimrod. Abram Avino introduced monotheism to the world. Abram smashed the idols of his father. Terach informed on him to the king. Comes to the king, the king gives him an ultimatum. Choice. Either bow to the idol or you go into the fiery kiln. Abram says, I'm going into the fire. He emerges alive. Not his clothing aren't even singed. Okay? Nimro realizes he's an uncontrollable force. Abram is the Ivri. He takes on the world single handedly. Abram defeats the four, the four mightiest kings, Avramavina. Avramavina was a force which cannot be stopped. Anybody engaged in dialogue of theology with Avram was convinced to, that there's monotheism. There's only one God. He refuted paganism. Okay? What happens? Esau, the Torah tells his story, he's bought Oyef min He returns from the field weary, worn out, he comes home and he sees his brother Yaakov cooking a pot of lentil soup and he has his forehead is, 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 has soot on it from the, from the charcoal and he says Yaakov what happened? What's going on? He says this is a Kainenu mess. Our grandfather passed away. This is what Yaakov tells his, tells his brother. Mm-hmm. His twin. So when Esau hears this, he says, Les din les dayon. There's no judgment, there's no judge. Everything's random. When he hears this, so he has the question, well, everybody has to die eventually. Right? So I mean, what do you mean, les din? Here's his grandfather that passed away. Les din les dayon. There's no judgment, there's no judge. So what we explained then was, Yitzhak lived how many years? 180 years. Abram was meant to live 180 years also. Why did he have five years taken from his life? Because God promised him that he will die the Seva Tova in a good, ripe old age. If he would, would have been alive when Esau took the wrong route and became evil, it would have undermined the blessing, the promise to Avram. They forgot to five years off Avram's life. So Esau knew Avram was cheated five years. If there is a God, how do you sure change him? Not in five years. If that's the case, let's deal with let's die him. But he didn't understand. He was the cause that the five years should be taken from his father's life. Now, 
It says, on that day he committed five cardinal sins. What were they? One of them was murder. He killed, committed murder. Who did he kill? Nimrod had the garments that God made for other Marisha when he was naked. Those garments, when you wear those garments, it would attract all the animals of the forest. As being a hunter, he wanted those garments. These, these are these are the God of Hachamudos. These are that, so special garments. Nimrod had them. Nimrod wasn't willing to release them, to relinquish them to Esau. So you know what he did? He killed them. Isn't it a little unusual? The day that Nimrod is, die, is killed, Avraham Avinu dies the same day. Why did they die the same day? The answer is because the world cannot exist with an Avram without a Nimrod to counter his influence. Because God created the world that you have to always be in a position to make a choice. Ch- Avram was so overwhelmingly convincing, you had to have a counterforce to somehow blur that obviousness, which was irrefutable. Nimrod was that person. If Nimrod's dead, Avram has to pass away. Because the counterforce doesn't exist any longer. Now, who was the counterforce to Yaakov? Esau. <coughs> Right, they, 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 she was, they were agitating in her womb. Ace of evil, Yaakov pure. Yaakov is cholok, ish cholok, smooth skin, is soir, Edom. Now, the day that Yaakov, before a person is interred, his neshama, his soul is still in this existence. His presence is still felt. When does the soul ascend to, to Shemayim, to heaven? Gemara tells us only once the grave is closed after intern- interment in the ground. So what happens? Gemara tells us they had taken Yaakov's remains from Egypt to the Morris Machpelo, the cave of Machpelo, and who arrives? Esav arrives. Although he sold the birthright, he says, "You took your your poor, your grave. You buried Leah there. The remaining grave is for me." And they start bickering and start arguing. The sons of Yaakov with Esau. And Esau is vehement. He's not willing to back down. It's my grave. What happens? And Yaakov is lying in disgrace. So Hushim, the son of Don, was a deaf mute. He was deaf mute. And he sees his grandfather lying in disgrace. While this evil man is causing this disgrace, preventing the burial, he takes a club and he lops off Esau's head, kills Esau. He could not tolerate the disgrace of his grandfather. So it says, what was Rivka originally said? She didn't want to lose both sons on the same day. So this was that prophecy, she lost both of them the same day. Because both of their souls ascended on the same day. Yaakov's presence and Esau left this world on the same day. That was the counterforce. Bilam and Esau and Yaakov. One was the counterforce. Bill Ahmed says, Lokom Novi Bisho Kamosha. Oh, there was no prophet like among the Jews like Moshe Rabbein. But it says, Bisroel, what about Bain Umus Olam? But among the nations of the world, there was a prophet. Which we'll explain in a moment. Bilam. So Bilam was the prophet of the nations. Moshe is the prophet of the Jews. So who was the counterforce to Moshe? Bilam. What happened if the villain was killed? He was killed in this war. The war, which is not too much before Yaakov, uh, Abosh Rabbeinu passes away. If there's no Bilam, there can't be a Moshe. Because Moshe, his presence was so overwhelming, nothing could counter that. The only one who could counter it, a level of evil, which was as extreme as Bilam. So that, that was the counterforce. So Bilam, Moshe, now it's, it's time for to depart from this world. So again, it's that counterforce. Rashi cites the Medrash
Vimtomem ne Mahishra Kurish Bohu Shinos al Goy Rosha. To be a novi, to be a prophet. But not a prophet is is is, is a vessel. He receives a communication from the divine. Do you know what level of purity that person has to be? You read the Rambam in, in Hilchus Yisori Torah, Lord's from that's Torah. The person's thought has to be never detached from God. A level of purity, not to waste a moment of his life, fully invested in holiness. Bilam, what was it? He was a depraved human being. A man who committed bestiality was a donkey. A man who was pompous, self-centered. Insatiable desire for honor and for material. This man is worthy of being a prophet. It's a beautiful word, you know, in Pirkei Ovis when it says, in contrast, Talmide Avram to Talmide Bilam. The students of Avram and the students of Bilam. So they ask, why don't we contrast Avram to Bilam? If the students have these, uh, these characteristics, special or negative, what are we speaking of the Talmidim, the students? Let's talk, let's talk about Bilam versus Avram. Avram was was Daito Shvelo. Ruach the Mucha. He was everything negative. What are we speaking of the students? The answer which is given is if you'd look at Bilam, you think you were seeing Moshe off the mountain. He raided Kedusha. He was a Novi. He, ra- he raided, you'd think, he is. Avram, you couldn't see the defects, the shortcomings in him. So when did you see it? When you saw what he produced and you understood who he was. What did Avram produce? What did Bilam produce? It's like you have a tree and you don't realize the roots of the ground are diseased. So how do you know? But you look at the tree, it looks like a perfect tree. Each one looks as beautiful as the other. When that fruit bears its fruit, you'll know which, 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 which tree is diseased and which is not diseased. So if you look at Bilam, who was a prophet, a Novi, he was a Novi Hashem. Holiness. If he's that holiness, why is this? Why does he produce those kinds of Talmudim, those types of disciples? So that the question is from Tomar. Because the nations of the world will have a position to extricate themselves from, from guilt, from blame. And they would say, Ilu Hoyelot on the Vim, if we had prophets, Khazar Lamutav, we would have gone and taken the better a better road. We would have repented. Because we would have had somebody to guide us. We had nobody to guide us. So Hashem says, I'll give you a I'll give you a prophet, let's see what you do with the man. Hamid Lab Navim. He gave him prophets and they breached that that was secure in the world. Defense of the world. Initially, even the non-Jew had a certain semblance of control when it came to promiscuousness. The whole story. Balpor. This was this was this was the suggestion, advice of Vilam. So, this is a question, an obvious question you could ask. You know, a person says. You have a leader who's a genius, who has such ability. If you'd give us, we'd be a different kind of people. So you give him a corrupted, criminal, mafioso guy, person who's a genius. Mayor Lansky. It, could he teach him anything decent? He's going to take him down the wrong road. We need, if we'd have a prophet, we'd see it better, differently. So what kind of prophet did he give them? Bilam. A man who's totally debate, is depraved, debase, and everything negative about a human being. He's going to bring him down the right path. I mean, so what kind of answer is that? What's the response? They still could say, look who you gave us. The Gemara tells us in Zvochim, we read in the Torah that when Hashem gave the Torah to Klal Yisrael, He brought heaven to earth. And the mountain was like a, a, a fiery inferno. It billowed smoke. The world was quaking. And all the nations of the world come and run to Bilam. Is it Bilam? God is destroying the world. That's how the world was quaking. She says, no. How could they, he destroy the world? He made a covenant with existence that after the great flood, he's not going to destroy the world. Therefore, he's not destroying the world. So he said, that's by water, the covenant. Maybe he's destroying it by fire. So he says, you fools. 
Don't you know Hashem owes Lamo Yitain? Don't you know God is giving His power to His people? So they said, Hashem Yevorech Hasamu Vashonom. That was their response. Let them be blessed. So now the question is, what followed after that? Each one went back to his paganistic ways, to his depraved behavior, his depraved life. And that was, that was the end of the story. I mean, if you were able to understand what was going on at the moment, that the world cannot contain God's presence, and is giving Torah to the Jews, and this is God, how could you remain a pagan? So what exactly was that moment of opportunity? That one moment. What did they do? They turned their backs and said, we're going back to where we came from. We'll continue our life as it was before, as if nothing happened. Bilaam fulfilled his obligation, his role as prophet at that moment. They missed the boat. They have no, they have no basis for, for, to, to, to defend their position. We didn't know any better. You didn't know any better. You had a clear reading of what that quaking was. The world was to be consumed by God's presence. So how could he even give any credibility to what? To, to a deity? That a deity is independent of God? How is it possible? The answer is, you're guilty. You're culpable and you're going to be condemned. So that's Bilaam. It's true. He's, but he served his role as prophet at that moment. That's what happened. that Bilaam he wanted to curse the Jews comes to Bolok initially Hashem says don't you can't curse them I want to bless them they don't need your blessing they're blessed they don't need you so when he's going so Hashem says to him who are these people you're going with? So Bilaam says to Hashem, Ve'yomu Bilaam Elohim, Bolak ben Tzipor Melech Mov Shocher Eli. These are the ministers. Bolak, the son of Tzipor, the king of Mov, sent to me. So Rashi cites the Medrash. Afal pi she'eni choshev be'necho. Although I'm not considered special in your eyes, choshev ani be'ni ha'mochi. But in the eyes of the kings, I am choshev. I'm special. I'm seen as being a person of special quality. You understand? The person says, you're a subhuman being. But you know, but among subhuman beings, I'm king of the subhuman beings. You're talking to God over here. God said, who are they? He says, although you don't value me, but you know something, but among kings, these people, I'm on top. What, what kind of answer is that? Simple, simple understanding. So I think the understanding is you don't value me because of what I am. But there's a certain element of saving grace in me. Why did they value me? Because I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet of God. So as much as you say, I'm not a Kiddush Hashem, I am a Kiddush Hashem. Because the kings, they do value me. But who am I representing? I'm representing you. That's what he says to Hashem. find that he builds seven altars and brings sacrifices. So as a result of this, he thought maybe somehow he'd evoke the mercy of God to be able to allow him to curse the Jews, to save these nations. So he says, Ashivas Mizham Mizbachos. The seven altars. Shiva Mizbachos Arachti Enk Ksivkan. Elo Shiva Ham Mizbachos. V7. That means each one is something unique. Omel of He says to Hashem, listen to this one. Avosem Shalelu Bonul Fonech Shiva Mizbachos. Their forefathers, Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, in conjunction, they built seven altars. I, as one individual, I, I built seven on your behalf. Avram Bonar Arbo, 
Avram built four, and he cites all the locations. Yitzchak bon Echot, Yitzchak built one. Even Shem is Beach, Yaakov bono Shtayim. Echot Bishchem, Echot Beisel. And I, one individual, I honored you, brought such glory to your name, I built seven. Therefore, in the merit of that, I should be able to curse the Jews. Because I'm special. This is what the man says. Now, it's interesting. Moshe Rabbeinu says to us, Bonam Hashem Hashem You're God's children. That means the rest of the world is not, are not God's children. They're God's creation, but the relationship of Avla Ben, father and son, is not. When Moshe was sent to Egypt, he said to Paro, Beni Bechori Yisrael. They're not only my sons. It's the love as a father has to his firstborn. Beni Bechori. And you sell, you tell the father, I built seven. I, I, I outpaced your children. It's like a person sees a man. He says, you know, I knew your father before you did. That's what he used to say. And therefore what? See, you know before, but he's my father and you're a stranger. What difference does it make? Bilam didn't understand the level of relationship which we have with Hashem. He didn't understand it. They did I do. I have pay paced them. Therefore, in the mirror of that, we should be able to destroy them. That was, that was his point. That's what he said. Uh, even more so. Rameer Simcha of Dvinsk at the beginning of Vayikra which is Torah's Kohana, which speaks about the laws of Korban, cites a Mor in the Bukhim. The Rambam in God for perplexed. The Ram writes in Mor in the Bukhim, what is the concept of sacrifices? That a person has a need to serve, to serve a higher power. So, since there's paganism in the world, the deities, so a person has to have an outlet to be able to express that subservience. So if he wouldn't allow you to bring the korban, God forbid, that you would express it with idolatry. Therefore, he gave the law of korbanos that a Jew is able to express that subservience through the korban. Ramban reacts to this very strongly. He says, Chas God forbid, that's not what's about. It's, it's to activate all kinds of influences and coalesce them, this and that. So, Mason from Dinsk writes, the Rambam misunderstood the Rambam. That's not what the Rambam in God's Reflex is speaking about. Rambam is spe speaking that there were times in the history of the Jews it was called Bama, that a Jew was permitted to build an altar on his rooftop in his backyard mm -hmm. and bring a car wherever he was, he was permitted. That's what he's speaking about. The two types of situations is bringing a korban in the Mishkan or in the Beis Amigdosh. What's the difference? And the Mishkan, that's Lefnei Hashem. When you bring a korban before God in the location of the Shekhinah, it's exactly what the Ramban says. Ramban's not disagreeing. Well, what's the value of bringing the korban which, when it's not Lefnei Hashem, when it's not in God's presence? It's again, it's express that need to be subservient to a higher power. But in, in Lefnei Hashem, in the Mishkan, it's a whole different reality. It's exactly like the Ramban says. So therefore he says he misunderstood what the Ramban meant. In God for Now, Hazal tell us that the Ovis Hakadoshim, Hein Hein Merkova, they were the chariot for God. Wherever they was were, that's the Kochi Kadoshim. It's equivalent to the Holy of Holies. So when Avram brought his four Kabonos, what was its location? Before God. It's not a bummer. It's not he built an altar on his rooftop or in his backyard. And Yitzchok and Yaakov, the same thing. Everyone's Lefnei Hashem. Bill, I mean, he can build a thousand altars. What is it? It's in the, hin in the hinderlands. That's where he's building it. It has no, no relevance to God. You bring it for God. But is it in the presence of God? No. Therefore, he doesn't get it. Do you know who the Ovis HaKadoshim were? Do you know who the patriarchs were? The whole different the reality of existence. God created the world for these people. He's with them, continuously with them. Therefore, it's a different dimension. Therefore, again, not only is it bonum Hashem Hashem Elokechem, not only is it b'ni b'chori Yisrael, that the, the love is like a firstborn, were rooted in, in antecedents, in Ovos HaKadoshim, the holy patriarchs, that the relation was that that was God's location. Because, hey, 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 Merkava. So the whole, the whole 
beginning doesn't even begin to, to begin. Hashem gives permission to Bilam, you could go. So the Torah tells us He awakens early in the morning, he hitches his donkey, and he goes with the ministers of Moab. Rashi cites the, the Midrash. We see over here a man who is so pompous, so self centered. He should hitch his own donkey. It's beneath his dignity. The answer is a man who is so intensely ridden with hate, it overrides all protocol. He hitches his own donkey. Hashem says to Bilam, Russia, you evil one. Avram, their patriarch, he already outpaced you. He preceded you. Shinema says at the time of the Akedah, Vayashkem Avram Baboka Vyakush is Chamorro to go to the Akedah. So therefore, what you're doing means nothing. You're not demonstrating, displaying anything special. So I asked a simple question. If Bilam was going to show he does a mitzvah better than Avram Avinu, better than the Jew, okay. Here he's doing something which is contrary to the will of God, to curse the Jews. God even has to respond to this. The patriarch of the Jews, he, he already had preceded you. He already had demonstrated this characteristic of zeal. Why didn't? You know, he took the gun off the shelf to commit murder. Right? He woke up early. He planned it. What you say? Such a shame, Shemayim. What does that have to do with the sake of God? He's a murderer. Here you're doing everything. This is the worst. This is equivalent of blasphemy. What does Hashem even have to respond to this? Now, there was no greater prosecutor than Bilam. He hated the Jews to his core. And he wanted to bring about a level of prosecution that you couldn't quell that prosecution. So he said, this is what he wanted to do. A human being has inborn characteristics. One of them is zeal. The person would do something in a zealous way with alacrity. So he says, he gets up early, hitches his donkey to curse the Jews. That means if he's able to do this with such intensity, What's total being consumed with it? Did the Jews ever demonstrate that characteristic displayed in your honor? If they didn't, then there's a claim. Hashem says, you know something? Nothing. We already did it. They're fully invested. That characteristic, Abram being the seal of Kim, whatever he is, he rose early to bring the sun as a Therefore, what you're doing is nothing. It's meaningless. Therefore, there's no claim whatsoever.